away from you and soon forget to pray. But when the sky grows darker and courage turns to fear, my anxious voice cries upward with words who want to hear. Lord, I need you. Psalms, it'll be right after that, it'll be Proverbs, and I'd like to go to Proverbs chapter 30 as well, and this morning we're going to introduce ourselves into our gospel series, and if you'll forgive me while you're finding your place, I'm going to go over and hug a tree, uh, just real quickly. Amen. Crank it. It's cold in here this morning, and so I turned the temperature up just a little bit. I know y'all think I'm nuts when I go over there during the service and do something like it's like I'm hugging a tree, but that the tree is covering up our thermostat <laughs> and so turning down the temperature just a little bit. I'm really excited. I always am. Whenever I begin a series in the Bible, a lot of times people ask me, what's your life verse? And that's a really hard one for me. I've never had an answer to that question. I always tell them, you know, the Bible. I like the Bible. It's just, it's just amazing how every day... God can speak to me through a verse of the Scripture. Now, there are times in my life when God has spoken to me through His Word, and there's been a verse in particular that's been a help, but I'm not always at the same place I was before. And so different portions of the Scripture, it's always a tough one, isn't it, when people pick a life verse and then they want to know what your life verse is, and I just make up something every time that they ask me that because I just love the Bible, love the Word of God. When I'm preaching through a series in the Scripture, I'm always really excited about where I'm at. And I always uh, really enjoy that. And, uh, you know, it just seems like every time I begin a new series, it's like, now this one I'm really excited about. You know, <laughs> like I wasn't excited about the last one I was. Mm -hmm. But that's the way God's Word is. This book's alive. You know, it is, as Hebrews says, it's quick. means it's alive, it's powerful, and it's sharper than a two-edged sword. And the description goes on further to say that it is able to divide uh, between the soul and the spirit, and it is able to divide between the joints and the marrow, and it's a discerner, of the thoughts and the intents 
of the heart. And man, God does get right to the issue, doesn't He? It's incredible to me sometimes when we have problems and we're debating or we're, we're sounding out our problems and trying to figure out the solution for them. And then the Word of God is preached and the Holy Spirit of God goes, that's the real problem. And boy, He nails us and just gets right to the heart of the matter, right? Which is usually a matter of the heart. And the Word of God has the ability to do that. This book's alive. And we're going to see that today. We're going to see this is not just a book. There's a reason why there is no piece of literature in the world that rivals the Bible as far as it, how many people have read it, how many people own a copy of it, and so forth. I believe it's still Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, which is the second most read book in the world. But a lot of people, I think, are forgetting about Pilgrim's Progress, but no one will ever forget about this word because it is alive. It's different than any other than any other book. This is God's Word. It's very, very special that way. And we'll see that in our context today. Uh, if you found your place in John chapter 1, I'm going to read down to verse 5. I won't end our text today, but it will give us a good synopsis. And then I'd like to just go over it to uh, Proverbs chapter 30 and read a couple verses there. You don't have to turn with me to Proverbs 30 if, if it's too much for you to leave your place in the Bible. I don't want to be confusing this morning, but pay attention when we read the Scriptures. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness, notice this, comprehended it not. Now let's go to, if you could please, Proverbs chapter 30. And I would look at, I'd like to look at verses uh, 4 through 6 in Proverbs chapter 30. Uh, Who hath ascended up into heaven, or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fists? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name, and what is his son's name, if thou canst tell? Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. Add thou not unto His words, lest He reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Well, let's go to the Lord and let's ask for help this morning as we look at the Scripture. Father, please help us not only to understand the Scripture, but help us to know the Word that is Jesus as we go to the Scripture here this morning. Father, as we begin this series and as we preach through this Gospel of John, I ask that the Gospel would be so clarified in our hearts and our minds that it is natural for us to preach it, that it's natural for us to provide answers Amen. to those that are without it, and that this book of, that we're studying right now would affect our lives. God, if there's anyone here today that does not have clarity about who You are and about how to know You and how to know they have eternal life, God, I pray that today would uh, be the day and it would be the beginning of new things as we get in Your Word and as we're affected by it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm going to just make a couple statements here today before we begin uh, preaching in the Scripture just so that you know where I'm coming from. You know, I don't like when somebody is sneaky about where they're coming from. Do you? I remember one time I was driving our church van. I, mean, I had this, I think two times I was driving a church van in, in Delray Beach when I was assistant pastor about 100 years ago. And uh, I was, I remember one time I stopped at a Winn Dixie. And when I came out, there was a guy standing behind the van. And I'm thinking, why are you standing behind the van? You know, would something happen? No, he was waiting to ambush me. He had our church's name on it, and he wanted to argue with a church person. And so he started asking me all kinds of questions. It took me a while to figure out he was a Jehovah's Witness, but that's what he was. And he wanted to argue with me. And he wouldn't tell me what he was, he wouldn't tell me where he was coming from. On another time, I was in West Palm Beach, and I can't remember why, but I was at some type of a shop, and I came outside the shop, and somebody's standing by the van. And he starts asking me questions and trying to debate philosophy with me. Wouldn't tell me what he was. It took me a long time to figure out he's a Shia Muslim, and he wanted to talk about truisms and just philosophy and so forth. I don't like it when somebody just doesn't tell me where they're coming from. I mean, if we're gonna if we're gonna talk about something, you know, I don't want to have this ambiguous conversation where you just ask me a bunch of questions that I can't clearly answer because I don't know what you're asking, and uh, I don't like it when people do that. And I don't like to be that way. I like to be straightforward. Sometimes I've been accused of being blunt and uh, being, 
you know, a little bit too direct. But the reality of it is, is it took me a while to develop that characteristic into something I want to do on purpose. I want people to know what I believe. I want them to know what I'm saying. And it, it bothers me when I speak and it seems as though people don't know what I said. So I think I lack clarity. So I want to tell you some things that I believe this morning and uh, that we're going to see in John. I believe, first of all, that the Bible, the book that you hold in your hand or that some of you are uh, ref accessing on your cell phone or tablet or whatever device you're using this morning, I want to tell you I believe that that book was given to us by God. Amen. I believe it was given by God. The Bible claims so, and I found that that is a valid claim in my own life personally. I not only believe that the Bible is given to us by God, but I believe the Bible was perfectly given to us by God. I believe it was perfectly given to us by God. Our secondary text that we referenced this morning uh, talked about every word of the Lord is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. Add thou not unto His words, lest He reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. And so I believe that the Word of God is perfectly written in such a way that there's nothing more that needs to be written. The last few verses in Revelation tells us that any person that adds to the prophecies of this book, the curses that are in it will be added to you. And anyone that takes away from the pro prophecy of that book, his name will be taken out of the book of life. And so it seems like the Scripture pretty plainly indicates that it's a perfect book. Psalm 12, 6 and 7 says, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. This is David writing. He said, Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. And so it's an eternally perfect book. That is, it was given perfectly like everything God does, but it is still a perfect book. That is why in our church we have great clarity about the copy of the Scripture we use. Some folks may say, Pastor, you know, some of the words in the King James Version of the Bible are difficult for me to read. I understand that. I found, though, when things are difficult for me, one of the best things I can do is learn something. And so when you read a word that you don't know the meaning of it, here's some just free advice for you. you get a Webster's 1828 Dictionary, which was, uh, was, was built and made by Noah Webster defining words as used in the Bible. So you want to know what a word in the Bible means, get a Noah Webster's 1828 Dictionary and look up the word and you'll know the word. And then uh, you'll have better understanding. Yes, anybody ever used a word when you're at work? Uh, or acronyms or things you didn't understand and they're just talking over your head? until you uh, find out what the word means. Brother Lee does this all the time with us with his computer t slang and terminology. He's always using acronyms for things. You know, fats and PNGs. And I, you know, if I know what fat is, but it's not what he means. You know, I said, it needs to be a FAT32 format. You know, I'm like, what? You know, I, I mean, I'm 40. You know, I'm FAT40. You know, I don't know what FAT32 is. You so know, and, uh, so those things, sometimes, you know, we're not talking about the same thing. Well, look words up. Learn things. Don't dump down a Bible. Smarten up the person no, so that you right. can understand it. And as you say, Pastor, I never thought that much about it before. Yeah, I'm not beating anybody up about it. I'm just telling you if it's a perfect book, you've got to, you've got to have the most accurate version of it. You've got to have a version of it that the translators believe was perfect. And uh, so that's why we use King James Bible in our church, in case you didn't know that. Uh, and there's, there's a little more to it than that. But that's, that's one of the reasons why, because God's Word's perfect. Now, having said all of that, I believe God gave His Word perfectly. I believe God inspired His Word. I believe God preserved His Word. And therefore, I believe when the Word of God is read and preached, I believe it speaks to me on behalf of God. Amen. In other words, we can say, Thus saith the Lord. I can say to you today as a mere mortal, God says. And know confidently that it's so what I'm saying. Now, isn't that wonderful? Because people don't know anything today. With confidence, do they? Do you really know that? Is that really true? I mean, nobody knows anything. You're a boy. Are you really a boy? You're a, are you really a girl? I, I'm not being mean. I'm not making jokes this morning. I don't think that's funny, actually. The reality of it, though, is that people are confused about everything today because they don't know anything for sure. But we have a book that God read, that God wrote, that God gave us. You say, did God write the Bible? Yes, He did. He used human instruments and He gave it to them exactly the way it should be. There's no way in the world over the period of time that the Bible was written using as many different human instruments that a book could be cohesive and without contradiction, but the Word of God did it. It's a perfect book. And so when I preach the Word of God to you here this morning, I want you to know something. You don't need to come to this church and hear preaching because you like pastor's personality. The truth of the matter is you don't have to like me at all, but the Word of God it will help you anyway. 
You don't have to come here this morning uh, and think, well, you know something, you know, I don't think pastor's intelligent enough to help me. No, pastor doesn't have to need be intelligent. He's just got to preach the Word of God. And you can be helped by it. And I find a great deal of help in that, a lot of confidence. Here's something else, Christian, listen to me. You don't have to be a theologian to know what God says. I remember when I was in college and I, I wanted to work in a ministry with a man and we began having a discussion before uh, we partnered up. And one of the things that concerned me was what he believed about the Bible. I asked him, I said, do you believe the Bible is perfect? He said, well, I believe it was given perfectly. And I said, well, do you believe it's a perfect book? He said, well, I, he's... He said, "I think there, are, you know, there are contradictions, or there, are, you know, there are, uh, there, you know, we don't know exactly which texts are accurate." I thought, "Uh oh, that's not good." Well, then how do we know what's true, what isn't true, in it? And he said, "Well, you know, it's really not no important doctrines that we don't, that we're not sure about what the Bible says." Well, you tell me what doctrine isn't important. I'd like to know that. You know, what teaching doesn't have uh, fruits? All false teaching has fruits. And then I asked him the, the, the most important question, get this, because this helped me in my ministry as a young man to understand the importance of how we look at the Scripture. I asked him, I said, do you believe that a person, that any person, if, they're, if they don't know Hebrew and they don't know Greek and they can't go back to the text and read all the different ones and compare them, do you believe that a lay person could just read the Bible and know for sure what God says? You know what he told me? I don't think that's possible. So I don't think that's possible. He says, you know, you, you know, I just thought, you know something? That's just, you know, the, with the help of the Holy Spirit and with a, a heart of submission to say whatever God says, I'll, I'll obey and I'll agree with God. Any believer can know the Word of God. That's what Peter wrote when he said, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. So the Bible, you ever heard someone say, well, I know that's what you believe, but I don't interpret that text that way. Well, the Bible says you're not permitted to interpret text. In other words, God meant what He said. He wrote what He meant, what He intended to write. And if you'll be honest about it, with the help of the Holy Spirit, you'll get exactly what He said. Yeah. You ever play, you know, that, that's, that's all lawyer games, isn't it? Trying to figure out a way to interpret things. You write a contract, you have an agreement, and they, both parties shake hands and they know what they meant. But somebody tries to find a flaw. Tries to find something that's not exactly plainly written. And so now today, for two people to make an agreement, you've got to write a book explaining what every explanation means. The Bible isn't written that way. The Bible's written plainly, simply, so that individuals who say, God, I want to know you, can know what God says. We do it. We play that game sometimes with, uh, when we, with uh, authority sometimes, don't we? You ever uh, uh, had, uh, as a kid, you ever played the, I know mom and dad said, but they didn't say, right? Well, he said, don't go to Quick Trip, but he didn't say don't go to Pump Mart. You know? Well, listen, if, if mom and dad said don't go to Quick Trip, what they meant is I don't want you going to those places. That's what they meant. You know it. And the way That's the way the Word of God is written. You want to play games, you're playing games not with a man. You're playing games with God. And guess what? You're not on His level. And you won't stand in judgment of Him. He'll judge you someday. And so we need to know what God's Word says. I want you to know that because we're talking a lot about the Word of God. Jesus Christ was what is called the incarnate Word of God. Carnate uh, just comes from a word carne, which means flesh. So Jesus was actually God, His Word in the flesh. I want to talk to you a little bit about the Gospel of John. Uh, and to uh, see right away, some of you all look at me like, what? Is the Bible the Word of God or is Jesus the Word of God? Yes. That's the answer to that question. I hope we'll answer it here this morning. But this will help you to know who Jesus is and understand what this book is and how it can help you in your life and what you can grow to know and understand about it. And so as we study the Gospel of John, before we begin getting into the text this morning, I'd like to talk about some things that are unique about this particular Gospel. John is not one of the synoptic Gospels. In other words, Gospel means, the word Gospel means good news. <clears throat> so good news. And the Gospel always is ultimately that Jesus Christ is God and Jesus Christ died for sins and Jesus Christ was buried and rose again and that you can know God because of Jesus. In other words, Jesus is the gospel. Jesus is the good news. In our Bible, we have four gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Right? My thumb comes out automatically on those. Uh, but we have four gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are what we call synoptic gospels. That is, 
They are synchronized. They're Gospels that you can read Matthew's account, Mark's account, and Luke's account of most of the same events. But John's account is not really synoptic. It doesn't really, it doesn't really cover the same content as Matthew, Mark, and Luke do. I'm not saying it's a better gospel, but it is a different perspective because what John wants to do is not just give a historical account of who Jesus is and what he did. What John wants us to do is know how to know the gospel. Whereas his intent is, this is how to know the gospel. We'd, we'd, let, let's go ahead and go to the end of the story real quickly, and I'll show you what I mean about that really quickly. I know you're not supposed to do that when you read a book or you study something. We're going to cheat a little bit this morning. And we're going to look at what John says is the reason that he wrote the gospel. Would you go uh, to chapter 20, uh, chapter 21? There are two purpose statements that John made after he wrote the gospel. That or, uh, John chapter 20 actually first. And then we'll go to John chapter 21. Uh, there are two purpose statements John made after he wrote the gospel and told about who Jesus is and how to know Jesus. In John chapter 20 and verse 30, the, John said, Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of His disciples which are not written in this book. He said, But these are written. What's that next phrase? That ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through His name. Why did John write the Gospel? He didn't write everything Jesus did, but he wrote what he did so that you can believe that Jesus is the Christ. Christ is the Savior. Jesus, that He is the Messiah. That He is the Anointed One. He's the One who came to die on the cross and to give you His life, His perfect life. And that believing you might have life through His name. So John said, here's why I wrote this. I wrote it so you can know Jesus, that you know God. Let me ask you a question. How many people need the gospel of John's purpose in their lives? Lord, I need you, Andrew saying earlier today. Well, we need Jesus, don't we? Man, I'm born, I, I'm realizing when, uh, when I look at myself, I realize, you know what, I know in my heart there's a God, just like Romans 1 says, and I know He's a perfect God, and I know uh, that I'm not perfect, and I know that if God judges me on the basis of what I've done, that I'm in a lot of trouble with Him. And I need help because there's nothing I can do that will take my past away, that will make the things that I should be judged for go away. I need Jesus. And John said, these are written that you might know, so you can know that Jesus is the Christ, and that you can believe in Jesus. You can't really believe in something that doesn't have credibility, can you? In other Gospels, we're told that the miracles that Jesus did, uh, that He did those, it's not just for the sake of the miracle themselves, but He did those to prove that He's God. So people could believe in Him. And so here we look at these, uh, we look at this synopsis or summary of John, and uh, He said, these are written that you might believe. Go to chapter 21, would you? And let's look at verse 24 where John again refers to himself. He said, This is the disciple which testifieth of these things and wrote these things. And he said, And we know that his testimony is true. Now that's interesting. You ever challenge statements when they're made? John said, You know what I'm saying is true. And well, how do you know it? Well, by the time you read through the Gospel of John, my friend, I don't think there's a person alive with an honest heart and open mind that could say, I don't know that Jesus is God. In other words, John said, we know that his witness is true. And then in chapter uh, 21 of John, in verse 25, he said, there also are many other things which Jesus did, the which if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Just like he said in John chapter 20 and verse 30, many other tr signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. So can I say to you on the basis of what John said at the end of the letter, if you go back to chapter 1, while I'm saying this, can I say to you that John's purpose in writing this gospel is not to tell you everything Jesus did? Is that what he said? So Jesus did a lot more. The world couldn't contain the books that couldn't contain the books that would be written. He said Jesus did a lot more. He said and many other things that Jesus and the presence of his disciples. He said, but these are written so that you can believe. So what is the purpose statement of the gospel of John? What is the purpose of this gospel? Believe. Help us to believe. 
help us to believe. Friend, if you're here today and you're a seeker, you're saying, you know what? I'm open to knowing who God is. I'm open to God showing me. If God approved Himself to me, I'm open to it. For my friend, the Gospel of John's for you. It's written for you. So you can know. You, you have a friend that's open? Man, one of the things that I encourage you to do, if you want to help a friend, is get, the, get them to read the Gospel of John. Get them to study the Gospel of John. And by the way, if you need some copies of the Gospel of John, we have some that are just printed with our church's name on it. They also include Romans and the first three chapters of Genesis, which uh, shows the origins, who God is, uh, how the world was created, and where sin came from, and then God, the Gospel of John. But if you want one of those, uh, or you want some copies of those, they're available for you. Let me know if you'd like to get some of those. And you can give them to your friends or family members. One of the things that I tell people with them, and I'm rambling a little bit this morning in our introduction, but one of the things that I tell people sometimes about the Bible, and I'll give them one of those short copies of Scripture, I'll say, you know, it's a little bit of a daunting thing to be faced with reading the whole Bible. But if you want to know who God is and you want to read some of the Bible that will help you, you can read the Gospel of John. And so uh, I encourage people. You say, Pastor, is John the only place to know the Gospel? John is the clearest place in the Bible to know the Gospel. It's the simplest and the clearest place in the Bible to know the Gospel. I could preach the Gospel to you from any chapter and any verse in the Bible. It's a cohesive book. I could preach the Gospel from Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And I could tell you what that means. And I could tell you what it means to you. But my friend John chapter 3, Jesus explains how to be born again. And I really can't preach the gospel well without bringing John chapter 3 into it. It just got to come up. And so this is going to be a real helpful series, isn't it? It's going to be one that's going to help us a great deal. All right, so then uh, what are some other themes or some things that are unique about the gospel of John? Well, I said first of all, it isn't synoptic. It isn't like the other gospels in that sense. Um, and then uh, it is unique in that instead of it's unique in the way that it presents Jesus Christ as the Messiah. We're going to see Jesus participate in the Passover events. John leads us up to the realization that Jesus Christ is the Passover Lamb. And that's important. That's an important event as well. It's something that's unique about the Gospel. Uh, the word life is used 36 times in the Gospel of John. The word life is used 36 times in the Gospel of John. That's something that's unique about the Gospel of John. You want to live? You know, there are people, couldn't, couldn't you say there are people who are, are, quote, alive, but not really living? You don't know what you're created for, my friend. You are functioning, you're trying to live, but you're not succeeding at it. In the Gospel of John, if you want to live, you want to have life, know what your purpose is. Know that you have eternal life. The Gospel of John is, is a book that carries that theme. Uh, the Gospel of John is a book of the Bible that has the most metaphors for Jesus. In other words, in other words, words other than Jesus or God's name to describe Him. In our context today, we see two. We see Jesus being called the Word, and we see Jesus being called Light. Light and Word are metaphors for who Jesus is. And so a lot of metaphors that illustrate or help us to understand. Now some of y'all are already making buzzing noises like you're sawing logs or something, so I know I need to get moving along and get into the context here this morning. Um, but I want to just make one more statement on the basis of the Scripture we just read in chapter 20 and 21. And I want to say that the Gospel of John focuses on the reader or focus us on readers who are not eyewitnesses. That is, it's really written with a target audience of people who never got to see the incarnate word Jesus. And that's a real help to me. Matter of fact, John is that letter, that book, where we are shared a prayer that Jesus made before He went to the cross when He prayed not only for those who are His disciples, saying, I have kept them while they're here, but He said, I pray for them also that we'll believe. In other words, it's a place where we're given insight that Jesus' plan for the gospel was not to reach only the generation that was alive when he was here, but that Jesus' 
as the Word was for us. This is a Gospel that's written for us. Now, I am not saying that in exclusion of the rest of the Word of God. I'm not saying John's written this way and the rest of the Word isn't. But I'm just telling you it's a plain overt purpose of the Gospel of John. That's a help, isn't it? So let's look at some things this morning and uh, let's make some conclusions from them and then you can go to lunch or whatever it is that you do after you wake up from my preaching. Verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now we see a couple of things in verse 1. The first thing that we see is that the Word, of course we know, is referred to as God. So in case you're wondering, when, when the Bible uses the capital W-O-R-D, obviously Word is not normally capitalized, is it? What do we capitalize in our language? Name. Well, we capitalize proper nouns like names. And so obviously Word is the name of a person. And in this instance, we're told that the Word was in the beginning. Now we're not told that the Word originates in the beginning, but we're told that in the beginning, everything that man can know, the Word was God. If you were to read Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, which is plainly referenced here, you would see in Genesis chapter 1 a very, very similar beginning, wouldn't you? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And if you look at the word God in, in Hebrew, it's the word Elohim. Any word in the Hebrew language which has the suffix I am, well, it would be I am in our language, but uh, Yov, uh, Mem in the Hebrew language, any word that has the, plur has the plural I am, I am ending is a plural word. That is, the word is not God's plural, but God the person who is more than one person. And this is a reference to the fact that Jesus, my friend, is God. In other words, John chapter 1 and verse 1 is plainly teaching the doctrine of the Godhead or the Trinity. If you were to read Romans chapter 1, when Paul talks about the things that every person knows in their heart about God, one of the things that we're told in our heart that we know about God is, is, is eternal Godhead. That is, he's, He has existed forever, and He is three persons in one, Elohim. And John is plainly, uh, not only in the grammatical structure, emulating Genesis 1-1 in John 1-1, He's not only emulating that, but he's saying Jesus always has been, and Jesus was God in the beginning. In our text today, you may ask, Pastor, why do we read from Proverbs 30 today? In our text today, when we ask, who hath ascended into the heavens or descended? Uh, who hath gathered uh, the waters in a garment or the wind in his fist? Who hath established, uh, what is it, the firmament? What is his name and what is his son's name, if thou canst tell? It's another reference to the same. And John is, I believe, referencing Genesis 1-1 and Proverbs chapter 30, verses 4-6. through 6. And so this is deep, isn't it? Jesus is the eternal Word of God. In other words, the question you may ask is, why Jesus? Why is Jesus the only way to God? Well, my friend, because Jesus is the only one who is God. See, you can have a religion, you can have a, 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 a system of practice where you try to do good works that you hope will cancel out your bad, but you don't have anything that gives access to God because it isn't God. And so Jesus is, the, is God to the exclusion of every false god. Jesus is, a, is God, and He's different than any other kind of God. You can go back to the origin of any religion. You can go back to the origin of any God. No religion begins with in the beginning. I can tell you when Muhammad went into an epileptic seizure and got up and made up prophecy. I can tell you when Joseph Smith committed scandal across the United States of America and founded the Mormon religion. I can tell you when Charles Taze Russell uh, corrupted the scriptures and, and uh, uh, got followers after, to follow after him and founded the Jehovah's Witness religion. I can tell you about Confucius. I can tell you about any religion. I can tell you about Buddha. I can tell you about the Dalai Lama. I can tell you when they came up with their, uh, quote, version of who God is. But you can't find anyone who was God in the beginning except Jesus. And so Jesus is God to the exclusion of all others. That is the clear doctrinal implication. And it's a big one. It's an important one, isn't it? Again, the use of the word, word. In, Jan, in John chapter 1, verses 1, is not coincidental, it's not unimportant. It is incredibly important because God wants us to understand that who He is and how He has revealed Himself to man has never changed. He's never deviated from His personality. Have you changed? Let me give you one. You, you tell me whether you agree with it or not. 
Pastor Price will never be a leader. I mean, I, I don't care if you if you agree with me or not, but you know, my wife says I'm, I'm a pretty strong personality and I'm a leader. She says, one of the things I like about you is you're a leader. You know, if I get around with a bunch of guys, I'll get us all doing something. And I'll be leading. That's just that's my personality. You know what my high school principal told me in my junior year? He said, you're never going to be a leader. <laughs> People change, don't they? People change, don't they? But God doesn't. God doesn't. You can change. Listen, you may be here this morning and you may have a fatal flaw in your character. There may be something about you that isn't right. And I'm here to tell you, God can change you, but God will never change. In the beginning, God. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It's important for us to understand that God's never changed. Society changes, doesn't it? When I was a kid, for a person to overtly declare sexual perversion or talk about things that are done in secret, not to be done at all, my friend, nobody would do it. But today to say that perversion is terrible or is wicked is so socially in unacceptable. <laughs> Times change, don't they? Society changes. You think God's changed? God's never changed and He never will. Uh, listen, you've changed. I've changed. But God never has changed. In the beginning was the Word. You say, that's really a lot, isn't it? Yes, it is. I'm telling you, the Gospel of John is so doctrinally loaded, so jam-packed with practical things about who God is that will influence and affect your life. You say, man, I, it's just, just so confusing to me, all these words. No, it's so helpful, all of these words. Get in the Word of God and see what it says, and it just makes so much sense, doesn't it? Uh, the Bible says in verse 2, the same was in the beginning with God. In other words, what was in the beginning with God? His Word. Mm -hmm. Which one? The Bible or Jesus? Yes. Yes. Yes, Jesus was the Word of God in flesh. But God's Word, God's manifestation of Himself through His Word, by His Word to us, though revealed throughout time until the canon of the Scriptures was complete, my friend, was always consistent. You know, that's why it's bothersome that individuals would try to say that in different time periods in which God worked with mankind, that God revealed Himself in different ways. Not the way that Hebrews says, God who at sundry times and divers manners hath has spoken to us by the prophets, spoken to us in the past by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by His Son. No, God used to speak to us through the prophets. Did they tell us something different than Jesus? No, same thing. But when God spoke to us the last time, He spoke to us with Jesus. In other words, Jesus was God's Word to us. What Word? Well, the one you're holding in your hands. The Bible says, though, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. John said, and we beheld His glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so we know that, and by the way, I, 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 uh, I left and went to 1 John for that quote, which is very, very similar in a different context. And so if you want to just take notes and go study, uh, 1 John will help you with that. Uh, but I want to go back to verse 2 or verse 3. And I want to look at who Jesus is as well. All things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. Okay, where did, where did the world come from? All things were made by Him. Where did we come from? All things were made by Him. Where did the universe come from? All things were made by Him. In other words, again, this is an in the beginning phrase. <clears throat> Origins. Now, that is a help to us to know where we came from. Who made you? God made you. You know, a little child doesn't have trouble believing that, do they? You can tell a child, God made you, and they'll believe it. Where did I come from? By the way, that's a lot simpler question than uh, the, <laughs> the alternative. If a child asks you where they came from, okay? Just tell them, God made you. Okay? And that's a good answer. It's true. So there you go. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Nothing has been created without God making it. But the doctrinal implication as well is that God owns us. The doctrinal implication of that is God owns us. You know what? I don't care about God. I don't, I'm not going to bow to God. Well, who does God think He is that I can only come to Him by Jesus? He thinks He's your Creator and He is. See, there's a statement which is partly true but partly fallacious a lot of people make when they're talking about religion and talking about access to God. The statement is this, we're all God's children. That's not true. We are all God's creation. We all belong to God, which implies that God has the right. 
to judge us or to send us to hell if we reject Him. But we don't have the right to reject Him because we're made by Him. All things were made by Him. Try making something and have somebody tell you it isn't yours. Remember our previous president when he said you didn't build that? You didn't build that. I like telling people that, by the way. It's fun. It's not necessarily true, but it's a fun thing to say. Uh, you didn't build that. <laughs> yes, we did. In other words, saying your country isn't yours and you don't have the right. You know, we're going to whatever and, and take your rights away. No, 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 no. It's ours. And God said, I made you. All things are made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. It's my life and I live it how I want to. All things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. You think God ought to be allowed, or God ought to allow you just to do whatever you want and have the results that you desire from it. My friend, it just isn't going to work that way. All things are made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. I hate that, Pastor Price. That bothers me so much. Humble yourself. Bow yourself. And you'll find God's purpose in your life. And you'll find out that God is better than you. And that your purpose isn't as good as God's purpose is. And a lot of people are struggling with this whole God made me thing. God did make you. And God has the right to tell you how to live. And if you'll just live His way, you'll find out He is a loving God, a loving Father, and that His way as the Creator is the best for you. We have some engineers here today. Engineers, how frustrating it is it when somebody takes something that you've designed and they try to use different specs on it than you're supposed to. It isn't going to work the way it's supposed to. You designed it, and you designed it with the specs that it needs to have for the purpose it needs to have, and it needs to be used within those limitations. I have a couple of old Volkswagen diesels. And one of the worst things you can do in an old Volkswagen diesel the years that I have is run the wrong oil in them. You run the wrong oil in them, the camshafts and the lifters will just eat right up. They just won't last very long at all. But if you run the right oil, they'll just go forever. Both of mine have over 280,000 miles on them, and if I'm patient enough, I'll get millions on them probably. And they go forever, but you run the wrong oil and they end like that. You got to use them the way they're made to be used. You got to you got to treat them the way they're made to be treated. You want to live your life a way God didn't make you for, my friend. You won't be happy, and you won't have good results. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And then we see one more thing today. We won't get any further than this. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shineth in darkness, and darkness comprehended it not. Jesus is light. Until you come to know Jesus, you'll think you know a lot, but nothing will ever make sense. Until you know Jesus, you'll think you know a lot, but nothing you know will ever make sense. There is nothing like knowing who you are in Christ Jesus that answers all the questions that you have, that shows you what you were made for, and shows you what your purpose is, and gives you light. Jesus is light. Obviously, sin and evil are darkness. In Him was light, and that light was the life of men. Now, you may be living, you think, but you're not until you know Jesus. No one has life until they have eternal life. There's no life before Jesus. There's no life outside of Jesus. There are many people that say, I'm living. I remember a guy, uh, a guy who was just a criminal. He was really an awful person. And I was having a conversation with him because... He hit Charlie and I in our boat. And he wrecked our boat and messed us up, hurt us real badly, lied about his identity. And I called him and he gave me a lecture on life. He told me, you don't know anything about life. I've been to prison four times and I've done this and that and yada, 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 yada. And I just want to tell you something. The guy doesn't know anything about life. He didn't know anything about life. He didn't know anything about living. He thinks he knows about living. You know, rip people off. Uh, treat people how you want to. Take what you want. Do what you want. Don't be told by anybody anything. And I want to tell you something. He was a miserable, angry individual. But when you know Jesus, you know what life's about. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Jesus comes in your heart, my friend. You'll have light. I don't know how many believers have told me before something similar to this, not these exact words. An evangelist friend of mine, Joe Shadow, and said, he said, you know, before I came to know Jesus, he said, I, I hated everything and everybody. A little short guy, and I think he had a little bit of a a Napoleon complex, as some uh, diminutive individuals do. And he said, I wanted to fight everybody. He said, I, I took everything anybody said to me as a slight. He said, I hated everybody. He said, I got saved. And he said, after that, he said, I didn't hate anybody and I loved everybody. And he said, it was just, I, all of a sudden the lights went on. Nobody's my enemy. God isn't even my enemy. And he said, it was just my whole life and my purpose 
was enlightened, was given light before uh, when, or came, when I came to know Jesus. My friend, that's true. If you think you know how to live, try Jesus. You say, Pastor, you know, you, you just sound like a religious nut. Well, I am a little bit of a religious nut, to be quite frank with you. The truth of the matter is, though I'm not religious, I know Jesus. And until you know Jesus, nothing else, uh, that, that just don't, won't make any sense at all to you because you're in darkness. My friend, without Jesus, you're living in darkness. And I can't say, state it any more plainly than that. I'm not stating that in a, a malicious, uh, mean-spirited way. I'm just telling you the truth. Without Jesus, there's no purpose. Without Jesus, there's no light. You don't know what you're made for, and you don't even you can't even be what you're supposed to be without Jesus. In Him was light, and the light was the life of men. And in, in uh, verse five, the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. That word "comprehended" there is a good word, but we don't understand it in our English language very well. The word in the word that it's translated from is the word "catalambano," uh, uh, which means uh, to to grasp or to grab a hold of. Darkness doesn't comprehend light. It doesn't grasp or it doesn't get a hold of light. The Bible says light shineth in darkness, the darkness comprehended it not. And so that draws us to a place or brings us to a place of conclusion today. I wish I could have gotten further, but we don't have time. You want to know God? You want to know your purpose in life? You want to have peace in your heart? You want to have joy in your life? You want to finally be satisfied? You've chased the dreams, you've chased the thrills, but they leave you empty? They do, don't they? I mean, there's thrills out there. There are dreams out there. And there's, there's a, like a fleshly joy you can have, but it just leaves you at the end of the day tired, frustrated, plundered, and empty. You want to know the opposite of that? Try Jesus. Darkness doesn't comprehend it. Uh, you ask a person who is not at the end of their rope. You ask a person, why don't you, why don't you come to know Jesus? Why don't you live for Jesus? Why don't you uh, let Christ be the light of your life? And you know what they'll say to you? I like the way I'm living. I don't want, I don't want that. I, I, I don't know why anyone would want to be a follower of Jesus. I can live for myself. I'd rather live for myself than live for Jesus. Well, friend, if you ever knew the light, you'd rather live for Jesus than live for yourself. But you can't know that because darkness doesn't comprehend it. And what I'm saying to you here this morning is that if you can get a little glimmer, if you can get a little glimpse of what's possible here, you'd see that you can't know what God is until you know God. And you can't know God without knowing Jesus. Jesus is God, you see. And Jesus is eternal God, creator God from the beginning. You want to dispel darkness. You want to expel darkness in your life, my friend. Jesus is the answer for it. It's Jesus. You know, sometimes as a Christian, we get so far away from the Lord that it's possible for us to be just a little bit of darkness. Sometimes we are exposed more to, those, the, to, more to darkness than we are to light. Man, I'll tell you, if you're an average, if you're an average Hollywood viewer, you're exposed to more darkness than light. That's just a fact. I don't even know what the stats are anymore, but pretty much most homes, I'm told, have media or television or, or some type of media on from morning till night. Some people sleep with it on. And what you have, and, I, and this is not, I'm not just I'm not bashing anything or anyone in particular, but what you have is a darkness worldview. And you're just saturated by it, you're just covered by it even as a believer. And there's very little light in it. Small wonder it's just such a difference when you come into a place like the church house on Sunday morning and you get a little bit of preaching and you get a little bit of light from God's Word. It's incredible actually that as much as we are exposed to the world, how much influence that just a little bit of Jesus can have. Actually, a little bit of light expels or uh, it, it repels a lot of darkness, doesn't it? Displaces darkness. But Jesus is light, and the, the Bible says darkness comprehended it not. The darkness is never going to be able to be in sync with the Lord Jesus. Darkness is the world. Darkness is sin. Darkness is wickedness. Darkness is anything that is the opposite of Jesus. And light and darkness don't mix, and darkness can't get a hold of light. Can't grasp so what does that mean naturally? It means that darkness has to flee. Darkness has to be, uh, darkness has to be expelled. 
And you know, it may be that you're here today and you're living in darkness. Let me just summarize this way by saying this. I haven't preached the entire gospel today. I've told you the gospel is Jesus. And that's the truth. The gospel is Jesus and everything that He is and everything that He did. But you know, I could summarize the gospel pretty quickly for you. I could summarize it by saying this. God made us. We've sinned against God. And you're a sinner and I'm a sinner. Because of sin, we're in darkness. The Bible says that sin has consequences. Not only have all sin, but the Bible says the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that's the truth. In a couple of chapters, we'll see Jesus explaining to a man who hadn't been born again, though he was very religious, explaining to him how to have light. And he simply told Nicodemus, except a man be born again, it cannot enter the kingdom of God. We're talking about the light birth. We're talking about spiritual birth. And Jesus told Nicodemus, it's as simple to come into light or to believe in Him as, as it was for the children of Israel to look at the serpent in the wilderness. In other words, uh, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. John 3.16 is a verse most people know even today. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Life and light are used synonymously in the Gospel of John. You want to have life? You want to have light? Jesus is the way. Pastor, how can I do that? Ask. Here's how a child can do it. And the Bible says you have to go to God like a child. I know a child can do it this way because this is how I did it. When I was a child, I prayed and asked God for eternal life. I said, God, I know I'm a sinner. I know Jesus died for my sin. I'm asking you to save me because of what Jesus did. That's receiving Jesus. The Bible says, as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. That's believing in Jesus. That's receiving Jesus. And it's as simple as that. You say, Pastor, I, you know, that was, that was like a string of three sentences, and that's more than I can remember. Well, then how about this? Jesus saved me. Jesus saved me. Those are the words my dad prayed when he comprehended the Gospel. He was reading the Gospel of John from a Gideon Bible when he was at the end of his rope uh, when he was in his early 20s. And he just cried out and said, Jesus saved me. Jesus is all those things, but He is the source of our salvation. And just crying out to God, God will save you, my friend. It's that simple. You say, Pastor, don't you have to, be a, don't you have to change? No, Jesus will change you when He saves you. Pastor, don't you have to turn from your sin? Well, you're not going to turn to Jesus and, and uh, want your sin. You're not going to be looking to something other than Jesus. You can, you can add all kinds of implications to the Gospel, and while they're uh, not untrue, they're not the point. The point is, is that to know Jesus is to receive Him. And it's as simple as that. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, my friend, could I urge you? Could I tell you that there is nothing that will displace the darkness in your life except the light of the world, which is Jesus. And you can know Jesus by simply asking for Him to save you. We're going to see a lot of things in this Gospel. That's exciting already, isn't it, in this great introduction? We're going, to, we're going to get into it, and I'm telling you, God's going to just simplify some things that maybe are complicated in your life in the next several weeks. But you could start today, if you're in darkness, by just saying, Jesus, save me. And that would be a good way to receive the light. Darkness won't comprehend it, but you will. Father, thank you so much for what you've taught us in your word today. And I ask that practically speaking, that you would, Lord, just with your Holy Spirit, convince us these things that are so. Now, God, as we have our invitation, I ask that your Holy Spirit would evidence light to every person here. Lord, if there's a person here today that doesn't know Jesus as their Savior, God, I pray that you just make that clear. That they'd be able to say, you know what, I've done a lot of things, I've tried a lot of things, but I've never understood the simplicity of the gospel that Jesus is God that Jesus died for sins, and that what you require is, is to just have a person ask to be saved, and you'll give them eternal life. God, I pray that you just show every person that plainly and clearly. Lord, for believers that are here, Lord, that may be perhaps living in darkness or may be associated fellowshipping with darkness, God, I pray that you'd help them to see that light and darkness, they, the darkness doesn't comprehend light. They don't have any, any relationship. I pray that you'd help them to see the need to walk in the light as he is in the light. Before we finish our prayer this morning, I'm going to ask each individual to go ahead and keep your head bowed and your eyes closed. I'm going to ask that for the privacy of every person here. I want you to know that this is a private moment. My eyes are open right now, but no one else in the room has their eyes open because we wouldn't want to disrespect you or invade your privacy. 
I wouldn't call you out. I uh, wouldn't embarrass you. won't make you come forward. But I'd just like to ask a practical question here this morning so that I can be a help to you. The question I'd like to ask this morning is, do you know Jesus? Do you know the light of the world? Do you know Jesus as your Savior? It might be here this morning that that's a question that you hope the answer is yes, but you're not certain. There's a degree of uncertainty in your life. Could I say to you that it doesn't have to be that at all? It's something that you can know confidently. Here this morning, you don't know Jesus as your Savior. Or you don't know if you know Jesus as your Savior. I won't call you out, but just slip your hand up. And by slipping your hand up, you'll be saying, Pastor Price, pray for me. I need to know that I have Jesus as my Savior. I need to know that I have life. Just slip your hand up. Just slip it up. Slip it back down. I won't call you out. I won't embarrass you at all. Okay? All right. Here's a second question. You're here this morning and say, Pastor, you know what? The way I view <coughs> life, the way I view Jesus, is not that He's the light of the world. You know, sometimes I view Jesus more as a restrictor, like God wants to take something from me, than that He wants to open my eyes. You know, I haven't realized just how important it is that Jesus is the Word of God. I haven't realized how important it is uh, that He is eternal God. But God showed me some things here today, and I've... I have been not only helped by it, but I've been challenged that there are some things in my life need to change. And I just want you to know God's working on me about this, some matters here this morning. Would you pray for me? Just slip your hand up. Pastor, pray for me. God's working on me about some matters about light and darkness. I'm just slip them right up, right back down. I see all those hands. Slip them right up, right back down. Okay, anyone else? God, as we finish our prayer this morning, I pray for each individual that's here that would be struggling with the matter of light and darkness. And Lord, maybe there's no struggle anymore. Maybe maybe Your Word and Your Spirit in a way that You can only do has convinced them of different things. God, I pray that Your Holy Spirit would just seal the truth now as, as they've made decisions in their life. As they've said, you know what? There are some things in my life that are darkness. There are some things in my life uh, that God's speaking to me about specifically even if they don't fit exactly in that category. God's talking to me right now. And Lord, I just pray for these individuals that You would not only clarify and give answers, but that, God, that this might be a day that would be looked back to as a turning point where, God, they literally saw truth and saw things about Jesus that enabled them to have victory. Thank You for what You've shown us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to sing an invitation song this morning give everyone the opportunity if the Lord leads for you to respond to it. So before I have you stand and open up your blue hymn books, let me just explain the invitation for you here this morning. The invitation is just like the Word says. It's time we invite you to make a decision based on what God said. God may have shown you something here today. And so sometimes what we'll do in the invitation is, instead of singing, maybe just stand with your, uh, with your head bowed and, and just tell God what you've done. But you know, it would be a shame, wouldn't it, if God were to speak to us and then we say, well, that's interesting, and we walk away, but nothing is done about it. No, God speaks to us because He's trying to tell us something. Every time God talks to you, He's saying, I want you to. And whatever that thing specifically is, He's, he's asking you to say yes, or of course, or whatever it is. So the invitation is a time when we make sure we don't walk away without saying yes, Lord. Does everybody understand that? Okay, so we're going to take our blue hymn books and open up to page 252. And we're going to sing Only Trust Him this morning. If you're physically able to do so, you could stand. But feel free if you're doing business with God uh, and you need to pray or uh, talk to God, feel free to remain seated. And if you need someone to pray with you, uh, feel free to, to, to come forward. I'll have Brother Andrew take over the, the song leading if that happens. And, and uh, we'll, I'll be happy uh, to take time to be able to help you with Bible answers or to pray with you during the invitation. You see page 252? Only trust Him. And if you've made a decision this morning, go ahead and trust God with it and, uh, and tell Him uh, what you've told me. Page 252, Only Trust Him. We're going to sing all three verses and then we'll end our service. Come every soul by sin oppressed, there's mercy with the Lord. And He will surely give I trust in His Word. Only trust Him, only trust Him, only trust Him now. He will save you, He will save you, He will save you now. For Jesus shed His precious blood, 
It's a real privilege for me to be your pastor. I just, uh, I, I know I'm biased, and I think every pastor ought to be biased in the same way, but I just think that we have the best folks in the world. And I'm talking about you. I just, I just think about you when I pray for you during the week, and I just thank God I'm thankful for them. Thank you for the people that you've brought to our church. And I mean every one of you. It's just a, a wonderful place to be. Don't forget to pray about the folks that aren't feeling well. Pray for them. And uh, if you need anything, I want you to know our service, every time we close a service, the church isn't closed. And uh, God isn't done working. We close our, uh, we end our service times, but the invitation's never closed. You have Bible questions, you need answers about things. I'm constantly available and literally, I'll answer my phone in the middle of the night if you want to call me in the middle of the night. I'm not making that up. People that know me know that's true. And so you give me a call or you send me a text or send me an email. We're readily available and accessible uh, to be a help to you. I'd love to open the Bible and answer any questions that you have. It's not because I think that I know everything. It's because I know that this book has all the answers. And I can help you. I can help you and I'll point you to Jesus. And so if you have any questions about the message today, if it left, as sometimes messages do, more questions than answers, feel free to contact me or even talk to me after the service here today. And uh, right now I'm going to ask Brother Randy, why don't you dismiss us with a word of prayer, would you please? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. We know how holy you are, and uh, we just rely upon you for your guidance and protection. And uh, we pray, Lord, as we enter this uh, new study of John, that uh, you open our hearts and minds to your word and uh, to the truths that you have for us, so that we can apply them to our lives, and our daily lives, and get the gospel message out to those that have uh, either never heard it before or even those that have heard it and stir their hearts up to also give the gospel out. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, protect us, provide your protection around us, and also uh, allow us to uh, worship and give you glory. In my name we pray.